Exceptions, as the name suggests, should be exceptional, but you should still know how to handle them. Exception is essentially an error you also see in the console in Unity that pauses code execution. In this tutorial, I will show you how and when to use the try, catch and finally blocks. We will then also create our custom exceptions that will allow us to store more data about what went wrong. First, let's see what happens when we don't handle the exception in any way. So for this, I have the player mover script attached on my player. And it is quite simple, I only have those two functions, one that is going to be moving the player on update, and another one that will be checking for some coins in the radius on update as well. But you can see that in Unity I didn't assign the player transform, so now we are getting the unassigned reference exception. This doesn't only mean that we are seeing the error in the console, which is quite annoying, but it also means that any code after the exception is thrown is not running. So the exception is running on this line, and because the exception is in the move function, it's going to block any code that's going to run after it, so it's not even going to run the function check for coins. Which in Unity you can see that it is indeed not running, because we are not seeing the debug.log which I have here. In this simple example we should probably not really be using exceptions, but first I want to show you how to use them on this simple example, and then I will show you a better way. To handle the exception you should wrap the dangerous code inside of the try block, so in my case this line is quite dangerous because the player transform could be null which is then giving us the exception. So we have the try block, then we also need to have the catch block, where in the parameters we specify the type of exception that we are trying to catch. If you are not sure which one to use, you can always use the classic system.exception which is the base class for all exceptions. And then we can specify what we want to happen when we catch the exception. We can also save it into a variable and let's try to debug it. So as we run this code, it's going to try to execute this line, if there are no exceptions, it's going to continue as usual, and if it catches the exception of type exception, which can really be any exception, then it's going to run this code. And as we run the game, we can see that we are no longer seeing the red error, we only see the debug.log, which is telling us that we caught some exception, and then we can also see that the function check for coins is running, because when we catch the exception, we handle it in some way, then the code can proceed as usual. This is the main advantage of handling the exceptions by yourself, is that it's then not going to pause the code. And catching the exceptions also allows us to maybe write them to some file, or send them to some data server and then read through them. In addition to the try and catch blocks, we also have the finally block. And this one is going to run always, it doesn't matter whether we catch an exception or not, always the code in the finally block is going to run. So personally, I don't really think that you need to use this too often, but what is more important is that we can have multiple of the catch blocks. And what this allows us to do is that we can check for multiple of the different exception types. So first we can try to catch the unassigned reference exception, which is actually what we are getting in this case because we didn't assign the player transform in Unity. So if it is this type of exception, we can maybe do some debug.log, we could also try to get the value somehow, and then we can try to catch for any other exception. So now we can see it showing us this debug.log that the reference is unassigned because that's the type of the exception. And in case that the code would throw another type of exception, for example the divide by zero, which we cannot do, so for this I've added one variable for the division number and then I'm trying to divide by zero, so we should see this message instead. So this time I have assigned the player transform and yep, we can see the another catch block is running this time. And when you see that you are trying to catch multiple different types of exceptions, you can actually create your own custom exception and then wrap all these exceptions inside of it. So then the custom exception can hold only the relevant data that you need. I've created new class for that, which is the player move exception and it is inheriting from the exception base class, where you can set we have those three constructors, so usually you would include all of them. So there are the three base constructors. The first one is not taking in any parameters, the second one is taking in the message, and the third one is taking in the message and the inner exception. Then I also have one more which is setting the exception status. So this could be let's say not known status, it could be retryable status, which means that it's going to retry the operation once more, in that case it may succeed. Or then we could have fatal exception status, which means that we maybe need to shut down the application or do some kind of cleanup and the exception status is being set in the fourth constructor. So now when we catch any of these exceptions, we are instead going to throw the player move exception and we are going to wrap the exception inside of it. And the way that we can throw exceptions is really simple, we just write throw, then we need to create new instance of some exception, so in this case let's create the player move exception, 
So each time I'm passing in a different message, the exception which is going to be wrapped, and then the exception status. So now, as we are always throwing the exception of the same type, which is the player move exception, it's going to be much easier for us to handle it, let's say, in the update. So we can say try, we are going to move. So now when we catch an exception, we know it's going to be some player move exception. So we can, let's say, get the status and do some other error handling. But doesn't all of this code seem a bit too much just to make the player move? Because for this, we really only need those two lines pretty much. So you can see that all of the error handling is really adding a lot of boilerplate and throwing the exceptions is also quite costly so we should definitely not be doing it on an update like I'm doing it here. So is there a better way how we can go about handling the exceptions or the errors without having to write all of this crazy boilerplate code? Well, the solution for that is to try to prevent the exception from happening in the first place. So I'm going to remove all of this code and we'll think about how we can prevent the exception from happening. This looks much better. First, let's take a look at the division number, so this should definitely not be 0. We could try to assign it a different default value, let's say 5, but this still doesn't mean that the player wouldn't be able to set it in the inspector to a 0. So a better solution that will definitely prevent the user from setting this to 0 is to add the range attribute, for example. So when we say the range of the value should be between 1 and 20, it means that in the inspector we really just cannot set it to a different number. And what can we do about the player variable? We definitely can just assign it, which obviously will get rid of the exception. But still in the future, the user may forget to assign it. For this, some kind of required attribute would be really handy, which fortunately I already have created. And what this required attribute is going to do, is that when we don't assign a value to the reference, it's not even going to allow us to play the game, and it will also give us an error. And if you are interested in the required attribute, you can check my tutorial about it. Great, so now you know how to handle the exceptions by yourself if you need to, but you also know that most of the time it is not really needed, because it is much better to prevent the exception from happening in the first place. But when should you use the exceptions? Well, let's take a look at two more examples, where one is the example where you again should not be using it, and the other one is section example where you should use the exceptions. Let's take a look at the bad example first. I have an array of floats, then I have a function which is going to get us float at some index, and the reason why this example is bad is because, again, we are using the try catch. And if you are calling this function really often, it's going to be quite costly. Because what we are doing in this case is that we are essentially forcing the code to get us the element at the index even if it doesn't exist. If it doesn't exist, we are then just catching the exception. But a much better way to do this is to first check if the element even exists. Because if it doesn't, then there is really no reason to be even accessing the array. So you can see that most of the logic where you could get some exception can be actually handled without the try and catch block. The same way with the null reference exceptions, you quite often can simply check if the object is not equal to null. But two places where you could and probably even should use exceptions and the try and catch handling is when communicating with servers and when using some APIs. Because some APIs and functions are expected to return an exception. So when the exception is expected, it is a good idea to try to catch it. But if the exception is not expected, like in the case of the null reference exception or division by zero or index out of range, these are not really expected, this is something that should not be happening. Which means that it is a bug, so in the first place you should try to solve the bug and not worry about the exception. But if you have a function like the validate, which is in the cross-platform validator, which allows you to verify some in-app purchase receipt, just to see if a user bought some in-app purchase or not, in this case, it's possible that the validator is going to throw an exception. So in this case, we should definitely catch it and then decide what should we do about it. Because in case of the validator, when we get some exception, it likely means that the validator wasn't able to validate the receipt. In this case, we should return false, meaning that the receipt is not valid. But if you would not be catching the exception, then it could mean that a lot of the code could break and it could just stop executing. So using APIs is definitely a place where it is a good idea to be catching the exceptions. And you can do something similar when communicating with servers, because servers often use exceptions as well. So the general rule when using exceptions is that when the exception is expected, you should probably catch it, otherwise it means that it is some kind of bug, so you should try to solve it in another way. To sum it up, exceptions and try and catch blocks is definitely something you should know about, you should perhaps use it sometimes, but the main thing is the error handling should not obscure the logic, because what could easily happen is that you have more code for the error handling than for the logic. If that happens, you should either remove some of the error handling code, try to get rid of the bugs, 
or you should try to separate the error handling code from the logic. I hope that this video was useful, if you have any questions or suggestions, drop them down to the comments, don't forget to like, subscribe and I will see you in next videos. Bye!